lift the smallness of our vision by thine own abundant life and by the vastness of who you are. Speak to your servants now by your word and through your word. We worship you in spirit. Now we worship in you according to your word. Forgive the one who speaks his sins. Hide him behind the cross. Help him to be the conduit that you want this morning to your people. Speak, Lord. We're listening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Will you turn, take your Bibles and find the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. We are continuing our journey through the book of, through the, of Hebrews, chapter 11. And we've been talking about how to live by faith. We start off by examining what faith is, and then we begin to see the different facets of faith, how we walk by faith. And so today we want to carry on as we look at the faith of Moses. And you need to keep in mind as we look through this that we're talking about what faith does. The writer of Hebrews, first of all, said that faith is this assurance of things hoped for. Remember that? The conviction of things not seen. It started with Abraham when the Bible said that he went out not knowing where he was going because he believed God. What God said to him was real. And so he moved out. In Genesis chapter 22 and verse 17, God had promised Abraham saying, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sands which is on the seashore. But things started off very slowly. The promise came to Abraham when he was 75 years old, and for 25 years he wandered through, from country to his own country to a new country, walking and up and down in the land, but he never possessed the land because the Bible says he was looking for a, a country whose maker was God. He wasn't looking at the earthly kingdom. He was looking in the future. So things started off slowly. With, and then he had a son, Isaac, when he was 100 years old. Now, if you were Abraham, wouldn't you be wondering, where is this nation that God promised me? I have one son. And then Isaac had twin boys. Remember that? And then things got rolling a little bit quicker down there. Isaac's son Jacob had 12 sons. And from then on, the family began to grow rapidly. Because of a famine, Jacob went down into Egypt. And when he got there, he had gone with him with 75 members of his family. But then we came to and as he went to Egypt, God blessed him, continued to bless him. And the Bible says the family began to grow. So much so that it became a concern for the Egyptians. And so we read in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 8, Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And sometimes I wonder how come he was a king of Egypt and didn't know Joseph. 
and that's for another story. But he became concerned about the rapid growth of the Israelites in his country. They were over outgrowing the Egyptians and so he began to oppress them by making them slaves and put hard taskmasters over them, treating them ungodly. But the Bible says even though all that pressure and anxiety, God continued to bless the Israelites. And they begin to grow and they continue to grow. And Pharaoh couldn't understand it, of course, so he decided on a new ploy. He saw that the Israelite was rapidly growing, and didn't matter what he did, they continued to be, be having children, and the nation began to rise. And so he came out with his number one uh, solution that he thought which was to every male child born to the Jews or to the Israelites, he commanded the midwife to toss them in the river Nile. And verse 22 says of, of Exodus chapter 2, that Pharaoh gave the order to all his people. All Egyptians got the, 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 the memo. So all of Egypt was in on this dastardly crime against humanity. So in every neighborhood, the Egyptians were on the lookout for any baby born in a Israelite home to report them to the authorities so that they could come and take their boy child and throw them into the river, in the river now. You know, human beings are capable of doing some terrible things in this world. Maybe that's why God said to, I, to the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 17 and 9, the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. Who can know it? The heart of man is evil. When we come to the New Testament, we see Herod try the same thing when Jesus was born. You remember that? He killed every infant in Bethlehem that was under the age of two because he, was, he figured if he had a blanket killing of the under two years old, he would kill the Messiah, the King of the Jews. And he was so desperately uh, anxious to hang on to his kingship. It's also very interesting that when Herod started his massacre, that Mary and Joseph took baby Jesus to Egypt to escape Herod's butchers. It's very interesting. So we see that it was in Egypt that Jesus' life was guarded, and it was in Egypt that Moses' life was saved. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 22 tells us the amazing story of how Moses' life was spared. It said, by faith, verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. And when you see the word beautiful child, it doesn't mean that he was pretty. It means that there was something about him that was special. They know that he was marked for something special. Now, I don't know how Moses' parents were able to pull it off. Can you imagine a boy baby in a home? The crying they make. But they hid their son for three months. But then it became dangerous. Something must have changed. He's getting stronger. His cry is probably a bit louder. And so they decide to find a new hiding place for him. If you remember the story, the plan was to make a, a wicker basket and cover it in pitch and put it in the river Nile. The very Nile 
that fear demanded the boy ch children to be thrown in. So they did. They made the basket, covered it with pitch, and placed it on the edge of the river, leaving Moses' young, older sister to watch from a distance. Now, Pharaoh's daughter, the crown princess of Egypt, came with her maids, according to Exodus chapter 2, came with her maids to take their morning swim, I guess. Bible said they came for their bath and spotted the basket. And the Bible says in Exodus 2 verse 6, she saw the child and behold, the boy was crying. And she had pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. What do you think should have been her next call? Call daddy. I found one. Someone said when she opened the basket, Moses attacked her heart and she fell in love with him. And her, his cry was like a battling ram against her heart. And then verse 7 says her, his sister, very smart young lady, who was close by, ran up to the princess and asked her, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women? That she may nurse the child for you? So the princess says, go ahead. Very cl clever young lady. So the young girl went and called Moses' mother. And the princess paid her to nurse her own child. Isn't that amazing how God works? That the enemy paid the cost of daycare, university, you name it. Isn't God good? She nursed her child paid for by Pharaoh. The one who wanted her child died. It's noticeable that the crown princess defied her own father's orders and showed grace and compassion on the baby boy. His tears touched her heart and saved Moses' life. I want us to pay special attention to Moses' personal faith. I am sure his mother talked him, taught him all about his people, taught him all about his escape from death. So verse 23 says, By faith Moses, when he was born, notice it, it was Moses' faith when he was born, 24 says, By faith. Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 27 says, by faith he left Egypt. He lived by faith. Trusting God to take care of him. So today we're going to look at the choice faith makes. Secondly, the courage faith brings. And lastly, the confidence faith enjoys. See, you can't tell me that you have faith and you're not courageous as a Christian. The Spirit of God gives you courage when you are a faithful man or a faithful woman. So first, first of all, let's look at the faith, uh, the choice that faith makes. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, verse 24 of Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, when Moses had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Isn't that interesting? That is a remarkable decision for a young man to make, seeing as how he grew up in Pharaoh's palace with all the privileges of Egypt. Everyone knowing him as the son 
of the crown princess with possibilities of becoming the next pharaoh of Egypt. He was being groomed. And there came a time in Moses' life when he says, no, this is not for me. The crown princess adopted him and prepared him, treated him as a royal prince, even Pharaoh. But he decided, I don't want that. And like Father Abraham, I think Moses looked ahead and he saw the invisible and he made a choice to throw in his lot with a bunch of mistreated slaves. Who would do that? You know, these days, if someone just get themselves, their foot on the first rung on the ladder, there ain't no turning back. And here he was. Possibilities of becoming one of the greatest rulers. To become like his great, great uncle, Joseph, second in command, or who knows, number one in Egypt. And Moses says no. Now, Mo Moses lived 1,500 years before Christ. But I believe he caught a vision of the coming Savior. In verse 26 of Hebrew, he says, He chose rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Beloved, some of us, we've been running down sin all our lives. But don't you know that it's passing? One of these days, age is going to catch up with you. And you're going to have that old, worn-out body dragging around without no vision as where you're going. Because you wasted your life after pleasure. Not realizing it's passing. It's not permanent. Whatever you are anchoring after when you're young, there's going to come a day in your life where you're going to hate it. Or it's going to frustrate you. So Moses knew that one day God was going to show up. God was coming among his people. He saw Jesus, God's son, leaving the majesty of heaven, coming down to earth to redeem his people. Because God had promised Abraham. He understood that in doing so, Christ would be ill-treated. He recognized he could identify with, here's Christ living in heaven with all the joys and the power and adulation of the angels and archangels in heaven. And the Bible said he left all of that to come to earth, knowing that he would suffer, knowing that we were going to kill him. Knew it. And he come anyway because he recognized that he was our only way to heaven. Moses visualized what Jesus would do. And so he said, I want a part of that. I am going to stand with God's people no matter what it costs. The calling of Moses and the calling of Jesus is our calling. Jesus said in Mark chapter 8 and 34, If anyone wishes to follow me, let him what? Deny himself. Let her deny herself. Take up their cross daily and follow me. Moses knew that if you, you're going to head for the crown, then it's going to cost you pain and struggles. So Jesus says to you and says to me, there's a cross for you, for me, and there's a cross for you. So take up your cross and follow me. Are you following Jesus this day? Now, you need to understand that the cross you carry <clears throat> may change. But at every juncture of life, there will be a cost for you to bear when you are following Jesus Christ. There's a cost. Salvation is free, but it's costly. It cost Jesus Christ his life. For some, it's going to be more costly than some. 
The cross God gave Moses involved renouncing his royal title, taking a stance with God's people, but realized that to do that, Moses had to make his own choice. He made a choice to stand with God's people, though they were despised by the people among whom he lived. But you know what? Faith will make it possible for you to take up your cross daily and follow Christ because he gives you strength to, to bear the cross. Now, there are two ways faith helps us to take up the, our cross. First, faith enables you to take up the cross because it sees that the world is changing. And everything in our world is temporary. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 23, it tells us that Moses was 40 years old when he made his decision. So for the first 40 years of his life, he lived in comfort and ease, enjoying the pleasures and privileges that his status provided for him. He was Mr. Big Shot. Then one day he thought to himself, what shall it profit a man to gain this whole world and lose his soul? And he began to think. He realized that the fleeting pleasures of sin was passing away. Look at him. He probably said to him, look at me, I'm 40 years old. I've been having all kinds of fun, but look at me, I'm empty. I'm still trying to find something to satisfy my soul. He realized that sin was passing away and he needed to get right with God. How about you, my friend? You've been running on the world, accumulating things, gathering things. Do you realize that's only temporary? Do you realize that one day you're going to have to let it go, whether you want to or not? The second way faith helps us to take up our cross is to help us to look at the end of our lives and ask yourself the question, what am I going to get at the end of all of this? Faith helps you to look for the reward. You see, Moses wasn't looking for earthly reward. Verse 26 says, He considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking for the reward. Not a temporary reward. He knows, he saw things just passing by, times change. And he reckoned, this is not it. I wonder how many of us recognize that today. If I had told my grandfather that we'd be walking around with a cell phone in my back pocket, he'd probably give me a thrashing and said, I'm going crazy. Now look where we've been. I'm talking about in the 50s. Some of you don't even know that. Look at travel. Today it's like quick as a flash. Remember the Concord? You could eat breakfast in England, lunch in New York, and dinner in Paris in the same day. Who would have thunk it? Moses looked at it and says, all this is just transitory. It ain't getting me nowhere. It's going to pass. It's going to pass. It has to pass. You see, following Jesus means taking up a cross, and if the pleasures of this world is all there is, then Paul says, we are of all men most miserable. If all you're living for is this life, you are miserable. Moses recognized that. And I think he began to think. Because the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 9 says, 
it is appointed unto man once to die. And then comes the judgment. And there is not a person living in this earth who will not come before the judgment seat of Christ. One way or the other. You come to get your reward or you come to get your... Well, it's your reward. Your reward for living a sinful life and the reward for living a, a beautiful life with Christ. He recognizes it. Moses saw through the whole facade and he realized that the fleeting pleasures and treasures wasn't worth it. And so by faith he considered or he added eternity. And when he added eternity to the equation, he recognized that death is coming. My appearance before Almighty God is coming. I better get ready. I better get right with God. Remember the song? Come and do it now. There's no hesitation. And he chose. And if we're going to follow Jesus, we must do the same. You've got to factor in eternity in your life now. Realize it will cost you something to follow Jesus, but please, Think of the reward. Think of the reward of following Jesus Christ. Think of that morning when you step on glory shore and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Come and enjoy the joy of your God. You wonder why you're going to bow? Because the pressures of this world have been wearing you down. And for the first time in your life, when you step on glory, sure, you're going to feel that burden lift. And you're going to behold the face of Almighty God in and through His Son. And you're going to recognize that it was worth it all. We talking about, we are talking about the choices faith makes. You got to make a choice. You cannot sit on the fence. You got to make a choice to follow Christ. You got to put your trust in Him. You got to believe what God says. The soul that sin dies. That's a promise. We're not talking about physical death. Because you're going to die anyway. But spiritual death. Separation from Almighty God. The Bible says, in his presence is what? Joy evermore. Away from his presence is torture. You make the choice. Because either way, you're going to have to make the choice. There's not a third. The second thing I want us to look at is the courage that faith brings. The courage. That faith. When you're walking in faith, you can make some amazing decisions concerning your life. Look at verse 27. By faith, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, listen to this, folks, has seen him who is invisible. He left with this confidence. God is with me. It don't matter where I go. He left Egypt. After Moses refused to be called the son of the crown prince, princess, he tried. You know what he tried first? He did what we, you and I will do. He, he tried to become a defender of his people. So... He decided to go out among them and see how they were faring. And the Bible says as he went out to see, look over the land, he saw an Egyptian beating up a Hebrew. And Moses didn't cry no quarter, as they say. He attacked the fellow, the, the, the Egyptian fellow. And Exodus chapter 2 verse 12 says, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. 
Careful what you hide in the sand. And he thought it was a secret. But the Bible says Pharaoh heard about it. And verse 14, I think, 15 says, Pharaoh tried to kill Moses. Imagine that. Huh? One day is crown prince, favorite son, next to Pharaoh in Egypt. Next day he's on the most wanted list. He's number one on the most wanted list of Egypt. So Moses, verse 15, informs us, fled from Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. Have you ever wondered why he left Egypt? You say, well, he was running from Pharaoh. Yeah, maybe. But remember, he's crown prince. He had influence, didn't he? He went out and kind of showed the Israelites that, hey, you looking for a savior? Here I am, beating his chest. Did you see what I do with that Egyptian? Why didn't he call, send out a call to the Jews and said, let's fight? You're over two million strong. Egypt know that we have, there's more Israelite than Egyptian. Let's take them out. Why didn't he do that? Why didn't he fight? I'll tell you why. First of all, God's people wasn't ready. They weren't ready. In Exodus chapter 2 and verse 14, the first response of the Hebrew people was, Who made you prince or judge over us? Here he is trying to show that I'm with you. And they asked him, Who made you prince or king or judge over us? Get out of here. You're on your own. Secondly, Moses wasn't ready. Moses wasn't ready at all. It seemed that Moses was a hot-tempered man. And who knows what he might have done as a hot-headed young 40-year-old, the mess he would have gotten himself into and the trouble he would have caused. He needed to get a hold of himself. He needed to learn self-control. And all these things God had to teach him. And it took him 40 years. So for the next 40 years, he lived out in the desert, tending sheep. If you know anything about animals, sheep is the worst thing you can ever try to tend. Because they're fearful and they're skittlish and they never obey nothing. But he had to learn patience. Because God wanted him ready and prepared for what was going to happen in the third stage of his life. So for 40 years, God taught him in the wilderness. And so Moses went from a man of a violent temper to a man God called in Numbers chapter 12. You need to underline that scripture. Numbers 12 verse 3. Listen. And this is God's testimony now. Now, the man Moses was very humble more than any man who was on the face of the earth. That's what you call super humbling, don't you? From a hot-tempered man who kill a man without even giving him a chance to putting up with these miserable people that he was leading. You remember how it used to drive him crazy? So by faith he left Egypt to prepare for his journey are putting his trust totally in God and God's promise to his people. You know, Moses could have easily given up when, when, he killed, when they tried to kill him after he had tried to defend them. He could have easily walked over and said, these people, you can't do nothing for them because that's what we do, don't we? We give up and we walk away. But the Bible says he didn't give up. He left Egypt by faith. In other words, he knew that God had a bigger plan for him. He didn't probably know what it was, but he knew. He remember how God saved him in the Nile. 
Remember how he was able to get out of Egypt when all Egypt was, he was on every wanted poster that was stuck up on the wall anywhere. And yet God got him out. He knew God had something greater for him. So by faith he left Egypt to prepare his journey of trusting God wholly. And he didn't give up. Here's the lesson. Focus your attention on becoming all that God caused you to be. Trust him to lead you in the right direction and to the place where he wants you. And trust him that he will enable you to accomplish more than you can think or even hope for. Trust God that he knows better about your life than you do. And that he's leading you somewhere. Now, you may be going through a tough time right now and you're saying, Pastor, it's all well, all well and good for you. But I'm here to tell you this. Keep going. The tough times give you stamina and muscles. Endure your, st your tough time because God's going to bring you up. Moses was able to keep going because verse 27 says, because, it says, by faith he left Egypt, fearing, not fearing, the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. He had hope in God, you see. Have you got hope in God today? If you do, one day you're going to see him. One day you're going to see God visible. One day your faith will turn to sight. That's how Moses made it. And that's how you will make it. Seeing him in your conscious mind, physically, so you can trust him. Lastly, I want you to briefly look at the confidence faith enjoys. When you're a person of faith, you need to enjoy the journey. There's no agonizing, worrying. What's the chorus says? Why worry when you can pray? Why are you worrying when worrying won't add one drop to make your life any better? Matter of fact, it make it worse. Some of you are sick because you worry too much. Your worry is killing you. Giving you heartburn. Giving you headaches you can't explain. Pain here, pain everywhere. Because you're not trusting. You're worrying yourself to death. But why are you worrying when there's nothing you can do? You're going to put your trust in God. Because He is able. He's an able God. So verse 28 says, By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn might not touch them. What's that all that mean? He said, By faith, Moses kept the Passover and the sprinkled blood. We know that Moses was a great man of God. But remember, he spent 40 years training or in training so that God could use him. I don't know about you. You, you don't have 40 years in training. But are you able to say, Lord, whatever it is, here am I. I'm willing to let you work it out in my life. And you know what that will cause us to be? Your struggles will cause you to be humble.
and it will allow you to recognize how unworthy you are before a holy God. It will cause you, it will not make you too proud to say, I am a sinner who needs a savior. Some of us, pride is going to kill us. We will not submit that we're not perfect. We will not submit that we lack anything. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord so that we are able to say, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I need the blood of Jesus Christ sprinkled over me to take me through this life. But you know, faith says more than that. Faith says more than I need a Savior. It says, you know what faith says? I have. A savior. Are you a savior. Can you say that this morning? I have a savior. Huh? You out there watching us, I can stand here this morning in inspired, inspired of my mess and say, I have a savior. Can you? Can you say the son of God loved me and gave himself for me? with confidence. If you can't, this is your chance. Do you want to be able to say that? Then ask God to save you in the name of Jesus Christ. Because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin and it keeps on cleansing. This is a cleansing agency that never has a break. It keeps on cleansing. It keeps on moving your head in God's will. And you know what? The blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient for anyone and everyone who call upon the name of Jesus Christ. By faith this morning, will you call upon the Lord Jesus Christ? For you who have, who have called and you, you've been, been on the way for a while, can I challenge you this morning? You call too. Because the blood of Jesus Christ keep on cleansing. It restores, it energizes, it builds up. And it caused you to stand in these tough days. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. And it is sufficient to cleanse you. Today. Today, friends today. May the Spirit of God shine the light in your spirit that you will say yes, Lord. Our Father, we thank you again for the life of Moses, the lessons he teaches us. Help us to get in our heads, O oh Lord, that you seek men and women everywhere who are willing to step out and said, cleanse me, Lord God. And may the blood of Jesus Christ continue to clean. So maybe this morning someone are hesitating. Somebody's not sure. But Lord, help them to recognize we can start at this point by recognizing by faith that Jesus Christ is Lord and he's able to save us to the uttermost. And he's able to save from the top to the bottom. The high flying and the low flying. Because he is God. And with him, everything is possible. Continue to cause your word to resonate in our spirits in Jesus' name. Amen.
We're going to be singing 629 as our closing hymn, 629. Stand as soon as you find it. as the last when clothing is brightness transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky his perfect salvation is wonderful love I shout with the millions on The rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and the car. Father, the Bible says, for in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle, and he will set me high upon a rock. That is your word. We're people of faith, so we believe it. And we are trusting, Lord God, today that you will set us high on a rock. 
and you will give us the courage by faith to stay anchored to the rock. Lord, there's trouble everywhere. Send your peace to govern the lives of your people. We ask you this morning once more, Lord God, for a special anointing of your spirit and a special filling so that we will be more than overcomer in our world of turmoil. And give us this confidence that he who promised is faithful. So Lord, we, we're all in. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your mission to save mankind. We thank you that you completed the job. And all we need to do today is to believe. Because the evidence points us to the reality of who you are. Give us courage today to live above the ordinary. Let us sense and feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, the one who Christ sent to us to comfort in the times of our need. And so today as we leave from this place, oh Lord, may your spirit go with us and unite us and continue to give us the victory in Christ. We are available for you to use in any way you see fit. And that fits your mandate to save men and women and to bring them from the veil of woe into the perfect light of day in your presence. We believe it. We trust in it. Give us the victory. And now may the Lord God bless and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and give you the peace that nothing or no one can understand. Only what the Spirit revealed to us in our hearts. To God be the glory. Amen. You know, a lot of things happen in our churches as we come together. <clears throat> people come, people go. But we have a special friend who's today.